kernels. Thank you. So uh, this is um, what I'm going to talk about is some work um, have done on kernels. And I, I had um, several uh, discussions in the last few days with uh, various people about the role of uh, the connection between theory and practice. There has been some soul searching, I think, in the community of how much this connection should be, and whether empirical evidence should um, inform theory or the other way around. And uh, I would just like to offer this as a small example of uh, theoretical work which couldn't have been done, well, at least by me, without uh, uh, empirical evidence really guiding and sort of helping to choose what to decide, what, 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 to, what to prove. Uh, okay, so, um, the, uh, so as everybody probably knows, but let me just very briefly remind you that uh, in kernel learning we have an underlying object which is reproducing kernel Hilbert space, and that corresponds to a positive definite kernel, such as a Gaussian kernel. And what you have is a space which is a space of, uh, you can think of it, it's requires some technical clarifications, but basically it's a space of all linear combinations of these kernels. And this is usually a very rich space. It has a lot of interesting properties, in particular algorithms which you get from that. Kernel machines and various other algorithms, they typically convex, they work well in practice, they're analytically tractable, and one property of it which is perhaps not widely known is that kernel spaces are KHS are natural generalization of Sobolev spaces. But unlike Sobolev spaces, which require to define derivatives, uh, this don't need derivatives because they're defined in terms of kernels. So, for example, kernel spaces make sense of domains where derivatives are not defined, like discrete domains for discrete data. Okay, so uh, now if you have a um, kernel uh, matrix, if you have a kernel function, then uh, the most basic object you have associated to your data is a kernel matrix. And kernel matrix simply for each pair of your data points, you take uh, k of x, i, x, j, you construct a matrix. This is a positive definite symmetric matrix, as we all know. And the most basic question about that, or, well, one of the basic questions about that is, what do eigenvalues? of that kernel matrix look like? Well, uh, here is one way you can kind of think of it. Well, this is one intuition you may have. Well, take your xi from 1 to n, and you can view a kernel matrix as an empirical version of a kernel operator. So a kernel operator is a population version, and the matrix is an empirical version. So these are two kind of objects. And now if you use concentration theory, there is some sort of semi-standard concentration result which says that the norm of a kernel operator minus the kernel matrix is of the order of 1 over square root of n. This is a little bit imprecise because these are really objects in different spaces, but let's ignore this. You can use a Hilbert space um, kind of representation of the matrix and use something like Pinellas theorem for this. And that would suggest that by if this difference is of the order of 1 over square root of n, then by some sort of standard uh, perturbation algorithm, the eigenvalues of those two objects should be also within 1 over square root of n. And one thing we know about kernel operators for smooth kernels is the eigenvalues decay. So if your i is kind of large, well, it doesn't have to be large, say 20, then this is probably pretty close to zero. So you would what you would expect is that lambda i of k is one of a square root of n of the order, okay? And now the question, well, is this a good intuition? Well, let's test it. Um, so I actually just choose 100 data points from zero one interval from the uniform distribution, take the most, the simplest kernel function, xi minus xj squared, this is in one dimension. And if you believe what I just said before in the previous slide, you would expect that lambda 20 S of k is approximately 1 over square root of 100, so it should be about 0.1. So that's a hypothesis. Let's now see what the empirical evidence tells us. Well, if you plot eigenvalues of a kernel matrix, I'm just plotting, it's a 100 by 100 matrix, I'm plotting the top 50 eigenvalues. This is the index of eigenvalue, and this is the actual value. What you see, is that the first one, a few ones are pretty big, and then they become quite small. And in fact, they're so small, they're indistinguishable from zero at this scale. 
So what you would say is that, well, we expect them to be 0.1, which is this line, but actually it is much, much smaller, and you cannot even tell how much smaller. Actually, it's about 10 to the minus 4. So 0 0.1 versus 10 to the minus 4, well, that's three orders of magnitude off. So once you see that kind of difference, you think, okay, that explanation cannot be right. Or, I mean, it's right, but it's extremely loose. Something else is going on. And indeed, um, what you can prove is the following. It turns out that, um, so this is a one theorem about eigenvalues which you can prove, is that take mu to be any measure on, say, a cube. I'm just saying a cube to make it specific. In RD, it doesn't have to be a cube. Uh, consider the corresponding integral operator with respect to this measure. And it turns out that for smooth radial kernels, lambda i of k mu is actually exponential in i. So it's e to the minus i to the 1 over d. This is the power of i. And um, as you can see, this is some sort of exponential decay, and at least in small dimension when d is not too large, it decays rather quickly. I am not going to talk about the proof, but the proof is not difficult once you have correct tools from the approximation theory. It's pretty simple. I highly recommend this book, actually, which is an excellent resource. and has a lot of information, well written. Uh, but let me talk now about some consequences of this result, which are kind of interesting, or some aspect of this result. So first, notice that this is a completely measure-independent bound. In a sense, these constants don't depend on the measure, so there is dependence on the domain, and that's it. Now, uh, you can say, well, this is some sort of integral operator, but it does apply to matrices, because you can view matrices as being an infinite, as being a um, kernel operator, on measure which is finitely supported. So it applies to all, mat all kernel matrices all at once, this bound. There are no IID assumptions. We don't need any concentration results, so the technology is completely different to prove something like this. Uh, on the minus side, well, I don't know minus, it's the difference is that, of course, it depends on D, and it depends on D rather strongly because the D is not the exponent. Now, you can kind of say that, uh, going back to the title of the talk, that approximation beats concentration when this is smaller than that, right? That when this gives a big bound. And when does this happen? Well, in low dimension, this would typically be much smaller than that. In high dimension, this is probably smaller than that. So you have some kind of pretty interesting transition between low dimensional, high dimensional regimes. And you can think that a lot of random matrix theories in this regime and what it is in practice is actually kind of hard to know because Technically, the ambient dimension is very high, but maybe you have some sort of manifold, and maybe the intrinsic dimension is much lower than that. So, but at the very least, you can see that there are certainly non-trivial aspects of this which are poorly captured by the usual um, concentration type result. Okay, so um, there are a number of other interesting uh, sort of consequences, well, not consequences necessarily of that result, but things you can get using approximation theory. You can, for example, prove that uh, V gamma, the fat shattering dimension, I'm not going to describe what it is, but it's like VC dimension. Uh, it's polylogarithmic. And uh, that itself implies that if you actually do want to do fitting using, say, gradient descent for kernel method, that can take exponentially many steps, which is kind of interesting because you can think of uh, doing fitting using kernel methods as just solving a linear system of equations in the simplest cases. And that system you can solve using Gaussian elimination, for example, in n cubed. But if I use gradient descent, I need something like e to the n. Oh, some, it's a little more complicated than that, but it's exponential. So there is some sort of big disconnect between what you can get with gradient descent and what you get with, say, some other methods. Um, so that's, um, um, that's uh, kind of what you get about gradient descent. You can also get results on eigenfunctions uh, and other things. And, um, okay, so I think... Uh, I would like to finish at this point. I think kernels are really interesting, and I believe that many modern machine learning phenomena can be ex 
explain if you understand kernel methods a little bit better or kernel spaces a little bit better. And uh, even some basic things, like despite 70 years of work, there are some basic phenomena which we don't really understand very well. And thank you. So maybe one question while the next speaker is setting up. There is no concentration and equality anywhere in the proof. It's completely different. C completely different. Yeah. I uh, come to my post, I'm happy to take this offline, but <laughs> to set up, yeah, it follows from that. Okay, let's thank the speaker again. Oh.